Oh, good morning. Good morning, Emma.
Good morning to uh, Roz as well. Welcome, Roz. We'll get started in just a little bit. I'm just cutting a little bit more material to get us ready for the sew-offs. I don't know if anyone else is like me, but I love the smell of leather in the morning. Oh. Using my little shelf as a cutting surface, so if it the world looks like it's rocking, it is. All right, we're just about set. And hopefully you're enjoying this Japanese music that I'm playing as an intro. And there is a story behind this coronet that's in the shot which i'll share with you shortly my my friend all of our friends i, I should say a friend to all of us uh, bill o'rourke told me about an event that's coming up on monday at 3 p.m local time so it's it's wherever you are at 3 p.m everyone is going to be called to do something and i'll do my best even though i'm really rusty playing the coronet or trumpet I'll do my best to demonstrate what we're supposed to do. And you don't have to have a cornet or trumpet. You can play it on your phone. You can do whatever. I'll explain a little bit more. There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to have you here on a Saturday morning. I'm sure everybody has busy things to do, but I appreciate you putting your life on pause and kind of joining for this uh, this live stream on this Japanese clone machine that belongs to Penny Young. I didn't plan on doing a live stream on this machine. Uh, it's been here since last year, and uh, it's been a real big project. I'm going to add all of the uh, pictures, uh, the links, uh, to the description part of this live stream. So if anyone's watching right now and you want to see the workshop magic uh, in action, if you want to kind of see what I took this machine through, what did it need? Uh, it needed a lot, as as Penny knows. When she brought it here, the upper tension is in pieces and it's, and it's taped to the uh, front of the machine. And then there's the motor is like torn apart as well. There's all kinds of things going on. And this arrived at the workshop actually in a table and it's going to be used in a table with a knee controller. So I had to do all the rewiring for the knee controller. It's an original, uh, those old metal knee controllers. So I have all the wiring done. The tables out in the uh, overflow area of the workshop. And I've got this wired up with a foot controller right now. So I can actually demonstrate the machine today. But it had so many needs. And then just the overall appearance of the machine because of varnishing and gook and junk and look at the pictures 
it was just horrible looking. And now it's been revitalized. It's been cleaned up from the inside out and it's ready for its little dance. So this will be great today to just show you a Japanese clone machine. And this particular one is from 1957. So as most of you know, let me stop our music for a second. Okay, there we go. As most of you know, uh, when World War II ended with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, when the A-bomb was dropped, and I'm not talking about our current president, who when he was vice president, he liked dropping A-bombs all the time, or F-bombs, or whatever he did. But at any rate, when the U.S. dropped uh, the A-bomb on Hirosh Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, it utterly destroyed their economy to produce anything. And so in an effort to help them out, we gave them the patents and the designs for a lot of sewing machines uh, from Singer and a variety of other makers. And then they took those patents and designs and they made machines like this right here. And certainly a lot of class 15s, you've seen all those. Um, and they gave them their own flavor. And again, when they were initially rolling out of Japan, uh, they, they started selling them in country and they weren't getting quite enough business that way. So then they started importing them into the U S again, we were encouraging this because we wanted to help them rebuild their economy after we devastated it with the dropping of the a bomb on those two cities. Um, but the only problem was they came into the country and they undersold, they, they priced their machines well below where other manufacturers manufacturers were offering similar machines and the result was a lot of these businesses went out of business and when they were rolling the machines in initially uh, you can see on the front of here maybe you can see on the front of here this is branded Fleetwood and it's a model 492 TW and if you have a similar machine to this the model number itself is right underneath the edge of the bed right here with the serial plate. And all of the Japanese machines that left the country were start, were stamped on the bottom several places with the letters uh, JA typically. And it was to signify that this machine uh, was had, had points of origin uh, going back to Japan. And they did that because after the initial introduction of a lot of Japanese machines in the U.S., and the Americans were still really upset about World War II and what happened with uh, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, all that kind of stuff that led us into World War II, all of that stuff. Uh, they started getting a little bit more clever about how they would label their machines. They had to stamp them on the bottom, but that was out of sight, out of mind. And so initially they had, as you've seen in some of the uh, videos on this channel, they had it branded with a big badge mark right here on the front of the pillar made in Japan as a proud badge mark of the origin of that machine. But as they realized that there was still a lot of bad feelings, obviously about the war and all of, all of that centered around that, they started moving the, the branding mark of made in Japan to the center of the pillar, the back of the pillar, and sometimes the right side of the pillar as it is on this machine. And uh, that's, that's uh, something you can see in all the pictures but you, I'll see if I can bring the camera over and show you as well. But they realized if we're going to sell our machines in the U.S., people are still upset, obviously, with good cause. And so we've got to be smart about how we market our machines in that economy. And for some machines, they even they 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 would stamp it on the bottom with JA or something like that. But they wouldn't badge mark it anywhere else. And they actually created, uh, in a sense, uh, fake companies fake company names and then they would label the machines with those fake company names to give it more of an american sound uh so that there was less objection about embracing their machines which were made generally quite well they were made sturdy they were made strong but remember as well like i've told you where did they get all the metal post-world war ii metals and all that are very precious they're very limited after a war because all the metals and everything are going into making bombs and bullets and everything else so where did the japanese get their metal to make machines 
like this and certainly earlier ones as well. Does anyone remember? Where did they get their metal? Because there wasn't a lot of metal left after the war. I'm going to look at the chat and see uh, if anyone gets it right. Oh, good morning to Paula, too. Good morning, Paula. Yeah, Roz, Roz nailed it, didn't she? Roz nailed it. Emma nailed it. Uh, you ladies are absolutely right. They, they harvested the metal out of the sunken ships, the Navy vessels, Japanese and American, that were sunk and were on the bottom of that saltwater basin along Japan. Now, what's the problem with harvesting metal to make sewing machines from saltwater? Does anyone want to venture a guess? And I know Emma is a scientist. Emma a, is a pharmacist, and all of you are incredibly smart. I know one of you or, or many of you are going to guess straight away, what's the problem with using metal to make machines like this and others that's harvested from seawater. <laughs> I think you already know. <laughs> yeah, Marie, well done, Marie. And uh, Paula as well, well done. Emma, well done. Um, so, yeah, the problem, the problem when you harvest metal from seawater and it doesn't have to be setting in there really, really long, but a lot of it was, is metal, any type of metal has some porousness to it. So as it's sitting and soaking in, in uh, heavily salted water, salt water, it tends to absorb those uh, elements, those particles, and it gets into that metal. And then when they process it, uh, after it cures for a number of years, um, and that's the beauty now. I've got that endoscope. Some of you have seen that. I've got this little endoscope that I can uh, plug into my computer and I can go on the inside of machines like this and look for signs of rust so that I can uh, let that owner know, hey, you know, eventually you're probably going to get some bubbling on the paint because that's usually those are some of the telltale signs with the Japanese clone machines where the metal was heavily affected by the sea salt is you'll get this beautiful finish on the machine. And by the way, this machine back here, if you look at the Facebook shots that I posted, it didn't look like this at all. It was Emma and Roz and, and Paula and others that follow the Facebook journey of the workshop magic on machines. They know exactly what I'm talking about. This machine just looked awful. But some of the telltale, telltale signs is you'll start getting kind of a bubbling uh, on the paint, it almost looks like the paint is kind of uh, coming to the surface a little bit and getting little bubbles. And then as you fleck it away, you'll see the rust coming up underneath it. And the only way to mitigate that really is to, to take off anything electrical on the machine, take the motor off and everything, and give it a bath uh, of uh, kerosene. Kerosene has, unlike regular sewing machine oil, Kerosene has a stopping agent in it that will basically halt rust where it's at. Uh, it does a wonderful job in, uh, you know, the, whatever rust is there is there, but it'll stop the rust where it's at. It'll soak into that same metal like the sea salt uh, did uh, in the seawater. And then you'll, you can at least have a stopping point then where it's not going to, it, it, it shouldn't progress. I'll just say it that way. Sometimes it's any of you that have lived in cold climates, you know, like Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, or any of the others that I could name, know that rust is a very insidious thing. And, uh, and that's why body shops make a good living in Wisconsin and other cold climates uh, because of that salt factor on the roads and everything. But all in all, the machines, um, the machines are good machines. And uh, this one, like I said, just needed a number of things. Upper tension was an issue. The motor was an issue. The, the owner, bless her heart, uh, Penny Young, because the bobbin winder had been damaged, I don't know if the machine was dropped or what happened, but she literally would take a um, almost like a knitting needle. And uh, right here where this, you can see this piece right here, this piece was missing on her uh, bobbin assembly. These are some of the parts right here. 
Uh, see if I can get it out. So this kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. Oops, there's another piece. This is kind of what the condition of the, the bobbin winder was that was on the machine. Oops, I just dropped another part. Uh, so what I had to do is I could have I could have tried to piecemeal it together, you know, trying to beg, bargain, steal from some of my uh, donor machines that um, have Japanese roots. But what I decided to do is I had one machine and I, I think I already took it back in, into the overflow area. I had one machine that was made by the Brothers Sewing Machine Company back in about the same time frame as this Fleetwood uh, that came out of Japan. And uh, I was able to take the bobbin winder off of that machine. It was a Brothers Sewing Machine. And, hold on a second. I was able to take the bobbin winder off of that. But the problem with bobbin winders, when you try to uh, fabricate them onto another machine, is over here on the balance wheel side, there are all kinds of tolerances. There's a cam at the end of the main shaft that turns with the balance wheel, and it sticks out further than the, um, the actual main shaft. And so when you're, when you're trying to mount, and you'll see this in the Facebook shots where I'm mounting it, and I'm having to drew, drill new holes to get it uh, mounted into place. But you have to take all kinds of things into account. When you anchor it into place, is it gonna have enough uh, pitch in to make good contact with the rim of the balance wheel? Is it gonna clear that main shaft cam that turns on the end? I had to do a lot of measuring. And most of you know that know me pretty well. I'm not a math guy. So I'm getting out my caliper and I'm kind of wheeling and dealing with it a little bit. And I finally found just the right spot. And I was able to uh, get it mounted properly, as you can see. If you're going to do any drilling on a machine like this, just be aware that because these are cast machines, if you want to, say, get a, um, I don't know, if you want to get like a 5 eighths hole so that you can put either a self-tapping screw or use a die set to mount it to the machine, take it in stages, just like you'll see in the Facebook shots of me. I started with a one eighth drill bit, and then I incrementally went up and up and up and up and up until I got the size of the hole that I wanted so I could anchor this bobbin winder to Penny's machine. If you start too big too fast, what can happen with cast material? What do you guys think? With cast material, if you try drilling into cast material like a sewing machine, and you go, I, I need a 5 ace hole. I'm just going to use a 5 ace drill bit. What can happen? See if you guys, I, I think you guys are real smart. You'll probably get that one straight away. Yeah, yeah, Emma's right. Um, you, get, you can get cracking. Um, and sometimes it's just hairline. But it's kind of like a windshield. They used to call them spider cracks on windshields. The problem with cracks is they, over time, especially with the vibration of the sewing machine, they get longer and longer and longer and longer and longer, and it compromises the, the strength and the stability of the sewing machine. So if you take it in slow stages, you can open up uh, that, uh, that cast material and port a hole, and uh, the, the body of the machine is not compromised in any way. So uh, just, you know, it's like anything when you're working with your machines, just be patient, take it slow, take it easy and don't rush into things. And, uh, but if you want to look at those Facebook shots again, in the description of this live stream, I'm going to put all the links. Uh, there's seven groups of photos and I always point people to those because they go, well, how did you get the machine ready for the live stream? How did you get ready for a premiere? It's all those individual steps that journey for the machine that get it finally to that point where it's ready. And so it's, uh, it tells the tale, you know what I mean? It tells the tale. Yeah. Yeah. Roz is correct as well. The cracking issue. And that's the only problem with cast machines is when they cast them, they're, they're dealing with a very hot material. And as that material cools, it leaves tiny little pock marks 
throughout the casting that make it vulnerable. You guys remember that machine that came out of Texas? It was a 130-6, and it snapped that leg off. And I showed you guys step by step how I how I finished that repair. Just like that other machine that we recently unboxed from Montana, where the back of the bed, you remember that one? The back of the bed was completely snapped off. Uh, it had been dropped on concrete in a driveway, I believe, is what the customer told me from Montana. Uh, so, you know, they're very heavy. They're very strong. But this goes back again. Why myself and you and others are always saying, watch Scott's videos on packing because the people on eBay and other places that are looking to make a quick buck, they'll they'll ship a sewing machine. Some of you have told me stories that, you know, it's why I have some of my gray hairs, you know, how some machines have been received. They just put them in a box and drop them in the mail. There's no padding. There's, there's no protection. But with a cast machine, it's vulnerable. It's heavy. It's it's strong. If it's you know if it's not put through the rigors of what some things going through shipping portals you know are exposed to, it's just crazy, isn't it? Just crazy. Yeah, Roz, Roz remembers the uh, the Montana machine, and I told you guys, um, you guys have seen me on videos where. You know, I'm a hardcore army ranger special forces type guy, but I've got a real soft heart. And when she called and was literally sobbing and in tears, uh, and I could hear her husband in the background trying to console her, you know, saying, honey, honey, it's going to be okay. You, you contacted the right person. I've watched some of his videos. I've seen some of his stuff on Facebook. She couldn't console herself. And then I started getting emotional with her on the phone and, and, it was just a lost cause at that point. We just agreed, Hey, you know what? Let's both kind of, let's both kind of calm down a little bit and uh, I'll reach back out to you next week, which I did. And then eventually she got the machine packed up and shipped out here. And you know what, when we get done with that machine, it's going to be, she's going to be overjoyed. She's going to be overjoyed. So, you know, there's thankfully I've never encountered a machine coming to the workshop that the workshop magic has not been enough to, to deal with the issues that have come in, including this machine right here. And again, for any of you that follow me on Facebook, if you've seen any of the photos of this machine, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So anyway, back to this coronet, back to this coronet. And some of you know, uh, back in, back all, going all the way back to elementary school and then into middle school and eventually high school, uh, not college. I never played, I never played trumpet or coronet in college, when I got to college, I was in choral. Actually, I was in high school choral as well. I was I was singing. Uh, but any of you that have followed me, you know that I played trumpet back in the day. But I haven't played trumpet for a long time. I played harmonica more recently. But I wanted to try, and it's going to be rusty, kind of like some of the Japanese machines. But I'm going to do my best to demonstrate what everyone should do. And if they, if you don't have one of these, then on your phone, on your iPad. At three o'clock local time, three o'clock local time. So if you're in Michigan, it's a different time. If you're in Japan, it's a different time. Your your three o'clock is going to be different on Monday. Same thing with Florida. Same thing with wherever you're at in the world or in the U.S. But at three o'clock, there's a movement right now to honor the fallen. And again, a bis a big misgiving, a big misgiving. And I'll just kind of take the camera and kind of pan it over here real quick. I showed this to Bill who told me about this early this morning. If you go over here and you kind of look at my little military area of sorts, this holiday on Monday is not, not for me. And Bill said, Bill said to me, he said, Scott, I know that Monday is not about you and other veterans. I know it's not about other veterans, Scott. I know that, but I still want to thank you for your service. Memorial Day is a holiday set aside for those like in the Japanese conflict back in World War II that died in the service to their country, men and women that courageously gave up their lives to fight in that war uh, that came about uh, back that led to the end of World War II and all that. It's not about veterans. It's about those that fell, those that passed away, and and also arguably 
Memorial Day is also an opportunity when you can remember veterans that had passed away. You know, if you had a veteran in your family, your dad, your mom, you know, your sister, your brother, whoever, a cousin, uh, maybe a niece and nephew, if they have passed away, Memorial Day, in my opinion, as a veteran, is it's totally appropriate to remember those veterans that served our country faithfully, men, women, uh, you know, and have now passed away. Now they're guarding the gates of heaven, as my father would say. So, you know, it's totally appropriate to do that. Uh, but it's not about, you know, going, you know, going out and about and, and you know, you see somebody with an army hat on or something like that saying, hey, you know, on Memorial Day, hey, thanks for your service. This is a holiday set aside specifically for those who died in the service to the country or who have served our country and have since passed away. So I just wanted to clarify that because, you know, I'm, I'm spending more time on Facebook now and I'm seeing all of these posts on Facebook where people are saying, hey, you know, remember to thank veterans, remember to do this, remember. To, and that's what Veterans Day is about. That's what Veterans Day is about. It's not about Memorial Day. So I'm not going to harp on that anymore, but I, I wanted, you know, we learn together in this classroom, don't we? We learn about sewing machines. We learn about the history of these companies. We learn about so many things and all of you have taught me as much as I've taught you. So I wanted to really highlight that. So as you're out and about over this weekend, a lot of people are going to be off on Monday. You know, you can, you can certainly thank a veteran. It's always appropriate to do that. But just understand what this holiday is for. Okay? Blah, 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 blah. All right. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to try to do now very in a very rusty way because Bill, I didn't know about this. Bill told me about this literally this morning. He reached out to me and he said, hey, Scott, did you know? I said, no, I didn't. So here we go. I'll do my best. Just kind of cover your ears a little bit. If you have small children in the room right now, kind of shoo them out just so it doesn't scare them because it's not going to sound great. I used to play the horn pretty well, but not anymore. So wait. Uh. Yeah, I'm supposed to be playing taps. It's not going so well. <laughs> so at any rate, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. I still have a little bit of toot on the horn, but not much. So on Monday at three o'clock local time, whether you, you know, wherever you are, three o'clock your time, um, take a moment if you can on Monday at three o'clock. And again, if you don't have one of these, and for me at this point, it doesn't matter anyway, because if I went outside right now and started blowing this, I'd probably have the cops show up. But three o'clock on Monday, on your phone, iPad, whatever you decide to do, uh, play taps. It'll be a special way to honor those, again, that died in the service to our country and also the veterans that have since passed away that served our country faithfully. So I'm going to put this away now. I actually played better off camera than on camera, but you guys get the idea. Tap. Yeah. Okay, so let's get a little bit closer to the sewing machine now. And I will put on a little bit more Japanese machine uh, music for the, the machine sew-offs. Let's see here. Okay, there we go. And you notice right away that our friends have also joined us today. We've got Umi and we got her friend. I still haven't come up with a name for our friend yet. And uh, while she looks like she has Asian roots and Asian heritage, she might also be from India. I don't know. But whenever we have Japanese machines, I try my best to remember to bring out our friends to welcome the machine to the workshop. All right, a little bit about our setup on this machine. And if I kind of tilt the machine back a little bit, you'll notice on the bottom of here, we've a side mounted class 15 style uh, machine. Now, does anyone know with this class 15 Japanese machine from 1957, is this gonna have a rotary hook or is this gonna have an oscillating hook? 
And again, the difference if you're brand new to sewing machines is a rotary hook, when it sews, that raceway is going to be going full circle around and around and around and around and around. An oscillating hook is going to rock back and forth like a pendulum in order to complete that sewing process as that needle swings down and that hook comes around back and forth. So what do you guys think on this machine? Is it oscillating or is it rotary? And uh, Roz is saying rotary. Emma's saying oscillating. So we have two different two different uh, camps of thought here as to this machine. And uh, you remember, we just got done with our grand prize winner, uh, Kathy uh, Pecor, coming to the workshop. And I presented to her. Actually, actually, I presented it to her twice. I did the initial live stream, if any of you watch that. And I broke her machine. And then I worked on it. And I fixed it. And then I presented it to her again in a second follow-up premiere. So, yeah, if you want to see the workshop magic in action, literally in action, as she's driven 200 miles to come pick up her grand prize, and I pushed the machine too far with, I think I had six layers of, uh, of heavy-grade denim. And, um, again, it was it's a replica machine, right? The 170th anniversary machine that I gave and uh, gave away for that contest that I presented to Kathy. And they're built well, but they're just not built to the original vintage standard. So I just, I pushed that machine too far. But that had the same type of hook system as this machine, if that clues you into how this one is set up. Yeah, Paula, Paula is guessing oscillating, kind of like Emma. Well, the correct answer is it is oscillating. It is an oscillating hook system. Does anyone remember? And I've said this. I've said this to all of you before. Does anyone remember um, the benefits of an oscillating hook system over a rotary hook system? What are the benefits of an oscillating hook system over a rotary hook system? If anyone remembers, just type it in the chat as a learning. Um, you know, mention so that, you know, as, as people are looking to pick out a vintage machine, depending on the type of sewing they're going to be doing, this may be a deciding factor in them picking a machine that's set up with an oscillating hook versus a rotary hook. So Paul is making, uh, as usual, all of you are, like I say it all the time, you guys are the smartest in the world. Uh, Paul is making a, an interesting observation and, a, and an astute observation. She said, I think that the oscillating ones could probably sew faster because that hook is not having as much of a range of motion to travel. It doesn't have to go all the way around. It's basically like a pendulum. It's going back and forth like this. That's partly true, but the speed of the machine, even though one would assume, okay, it's not traveling as far, it can travel just as fast going like this as it can like this, ultimately. So it's not really the speed factor, but the big factor about an oscillating hook is because it's not traveling as much of a range of motion, trying to travel and carry that thread to complete that lock stitch as it brings that thread around, you're able to use a much heavier thread in an oscillating hook machine than you are a rotary hook system without getting jam issues going on. It's almost the equivalent of the Swedish developing the, the hook system in their machines that's supposed to be jam-free. I mentioned it lots, lots, lots of times before. It's a jam-free raceway. So the oscillating hook system, if you're looking if you're looking to sew with heavier thread, let's say a top stitch is a big deal to you, and you're going to be doing top stitching on elk hide like this, or you're going to be top, doing top stitching on veg tan leather like this, or maybe even on saddle grade leather like this, and you want to sew with a much heavier thread, maybe a size 138, kind of like this stuff over here that I've actually used on machines similar to this before. I think it's 138. Let me double check. 
this stuff right here. Oh yeah, I was right. So this stuff here is, I mean, you could fly, you could fly a kite with this stuff. It's a uh, size 138. And then I even have a, a larger version here. This is 207, 207 on, what is it? On the right side and size 138 on the left. You could never, I mean, I mean, it, with great difficulty, you could never sew with thread of this size on a sewing machine that's rotary hook style. Uh, it just wouldn't work. It would result in uh, a lot of jams, a lot of headaches as you're trying to sew with it. So if you're wanting to sew with heavier thread like this because you're going to be doing leather pieces or whatever, and that top stitch is really critical, then you'll want to pick out an oscillating hook system because an oscillating hook system will tolerate thread like this much better, even if you're feeding it from up top. Whereas with a rotary hook system, if you're wanting, if you're wanting to try heavier thread like this, either the 138 or the 207, you'll want to feed it from the bobbin case when you're sewing with heavier thread like this on a machine that is a rotary hook style. If you try feeding this from the top on a rotary hook, rotary hook style, you're going to run into a lot of problems. So hopefully that's helpful. So let's just do a quick little walk around this machine so I can show you the lay of the land. <clears throat> now, Paul is asking another great question. I'm just looking at the chat real quick. And if I've missed other questions, you know, don't be shy to send me a quick text. I think I have my notifications on right now. Kind of like when I was doing the unboxing of this stuff from Del Rio, Texas, and I was holding up the really cool elephant that uh, uh, Emily uh, Oyama sent me as her first project on the FOF machine that I uh, set up for her. Um, if I miss a comment or a question, go ahead and just shoot me a quick text. I'll listen for that notification, and then I'll go ahead and respond to it. But Paula said, can you run heavier thread in a vibrating shuttle? The answer is no. And the reason you can't on a vibrating shuttle is... I'm actually going to grab, try to grab one if I can. So those of you that are, again, are really new to vintage, and you might not even be familiar with what a vibrating shuttle is. And I do have a playlist on, the, on this YouTube channel where you can look at different machines that have vibrating shuttles. But a vibrating shuttle is one of the earliest lock stitching solutions that um, machine makers came out with. It looks something like this, and it's got a very sharp point on the end, just like you would have on the hook part of the oscillating hook system in this machine. That, that point has to be really sharp because as it swings around, it's going to grab that thread and it's going to allow that, that stitch to be created. But this is the pressure band right here that's going to maintain tension to create that top stitch. The clearance underneath this is so tight, the way this uh, vibrating shuttle is made, that try to, trying to get a, a size 138 or size 207 thread to feed out of here correctly would be really, really difficult. As a matter of fact, you might even, this is a real thin gauge metal right here, uh, you might even damage it. So the heaviest thread that I would go on something like this is probably going to be about a size 69. And a size 69 would be comparable to in most sewing places uh, where they have like an upholstery thread selection. Um, that generally is going to be a size 69 thread. So uh, I would not try running anything heavier than that in this. Also, the, the barbell bobbins that are used in these uh, type of vibrating shuttles that Paula uh, mentioned, uh, they they're they're able to hold a lot of lighter threads but if you tried winding one of these with size 138 or size 207 thread you'd be able to i mean if it would work which it wouldn't because again as it's as it's feeding from this barbell bob and inside of this vibrating shuttle and it's trying to work its way underneath that real tight little band right there and then come up through this hole right here it would be so tight that you'd have a lot of thread breaking and it just, it would be a nightmare. So uh, 
So unfortunately, this type of system with a vibrating shuttle is not ideal for heavier threads. You could probably go, you might be able to go a little bit heavier than 69 if it was a, if it was a thread. Um, now, even a wax thread would, would create issues. So yeah, it's not, it's not ideal. Definitely not ideal. Hopefully that answers your question. But the vibrating shuttles in general and these barbell bobbins, this is some real old thread that I would never use. These are going to hold the equivalent thread of a class 15 bobbin. And um, I think most of you know, let me show you. Where is it? This is going to be a, a type of class 15 bobbin right here. So if you can imagine me dropping it, which I probably will, this barbell bobbin, when they're properly wound, will hold almost the equivalent thread of a class 15 style bobbin like this. And this bobbin that I'm showing you right now is the same type of bobbin that's in Penny Young's machine today. When her machine arrived, and this is again where, where we learn together in this classroom, it's so helpful because when Penny's machine arrived, it did not have a class 15 bobbin in it. I'm going to show you on camera what bobbin was in this uh, Fleetwood Japanese model. And I'm guessing that most of you will recognize it right away, right away. Let me set this stuff to the side. Oops, I just dropped a barbell bobbin. Oh, and another thing to point out real quick, I might as well just show you on camera, is... Barbell bobbins are specific to that shuttle, just like the shuttle is specific to the machine. So some of them are going to be a little bit longer. Some of them are going to be a little bit wider in uh, the shaft that the thread gets wound onto. Some of them are going to have wider connecting points that will slide inside of that shuttle. Sometimes the flange is going to be a little bit wider. It's going to be a little bit narrower. So if you buy uh, barbell bobbins or long bobbins, as some people refer to them, for one of your uh, vibrating shuttle machines, just make sure that it fits that um, that shuttle properly. Otherwise, it's going to struggle. It's going to have excess movement inside of that shuttle, and it's going to have trouble feeding that thread evenly to help create that top stitch. So, uh, just a quick little tip on these. And I, you know, you can see right away, even as you look at this. I'll really show you a stark contrast. Look at the difference in size here between these two, if I can hold them even. So you can imagine if someone's trying to run this short bobbin and they've got a shuttle that requires a much longer bobbin, it's not going to work uh, incredibly well. There we go. But that's a, that's a great question, Paula, a very, very smart question. You guys have great questions, and I, I hope I don't miss any of them that, that get shown in there. Anyway, I'm going to show you what, what bobbin was in this machine when it came to the workshop. And as far as I know, Penny was using this machine with this bobbin for some time. Uh so it really is kind of miraculous that she was getting any results, any results at all from it. Give me just a second here. Yep, that's it. Okay. So this is the type of bobbin that was in Penny's Japanese Fleetwood. And I'm going to do my best to hold it up to the camera so you can see it. And these are two different versions. The one on the bottom is an earlier version of this machine. The one on top is a later version of this type of machine. Does anyone recognize it? Let me set this down for a second. I just have to do something real quick. And then I'll look at the chat.
Okay, let's see what kind of guesses we got. Oh, hello to Michelle, too. I miss saying hello to Michelle. And if I miss saying hello to anybody else, uh, I apologize. Because I sometimes the, the the chat moves rather quickly and it disappears off the page. And by the time I look, someone may have said or you guys may have, may have even greeted somebody and I miss it. So uh, if I did that, I, I, I apologize. So both Michelle and Emma are both saying Class 66. And you're absolutely... Uh, correct. Class 66 is very different in many ways from um, a class 15 bobbin, including the fact that the bottom and the top on a bobbin like this are going to be beveled. You can kind of see it in the shot there. So they're not going to ride properly in that bobbin case like a flat sided class 15. Not to mention you're going to be hard pressed to try to wind one of these on a class 15 as well. And that's the... Um, I've mentioned this to you guys before, and I don't want to get too far off track, but if you're ever looking to buy uh, parts for, say, a 201-2 or a 1591, and let's say you're wanting to replace the motor on the back of the machine, the potted motor. Uh, if you're buying it in a place like eBay or something like that, be real careful that that seller knows what they're actually selling because the motor on a Class 15 uh, dash one, or excuse me, a 15 dash 91, the motor assembly on a 1591 and a 201 dash two look identical. They look absolutely identical until you look at the bobbin winding assembly, like this one that I mounted to Penny's machine. And all of a sudden you realize that the setup as far as how that bobbin is going to connect with that pin. So the bobbin doesn't spin as you're trying to wind it on the 201 dash two and the 1591 the bobbin winding assembly portion is completely different. So just be aware of that. And that comes to mind because obviously the 201-2 is going to use a class 66 bobbin like this, whereas the 1591 is going to be using a bobbin like that. And this one, this one will not mount well on a 15 uh, class 15 setup. This one mounts perfectly. So it's just, you know, and would that be an absolute sh uh, a showstopper? Not necessarily, because you could always use an auxiliary type bobbin winder uh, to wind your bobbins. But if you want to be able to wind your bobbins on the machine, just be aware that, you know, on those two machines, at least the 201-2, the 1591, you know, this is going to be the 201 setup, as is this. This is going to be the 1591 setup, just like on Penny's machine today. So don't use these <laughs> in a class class 15 machine because they're not going to deliver good results. This will. Okay. There we go. <laughs> All right. Oh, a quick walk around the machine. A quick walk around the machine. So first of all, as we're looking at this Fleetwood, I'll just kind of get it like that. It's a, it's a, Pretty good looking machine, isn't it? I like the look of this machine. Um, it's got nice lines. If any of you are familiar with the, um, oh, the Elna 2468 that I've shown on this channel before, that was actually made, some of them were made in Japan. Some of them were made also in Sweden. But the Elna 2468 has similar body lines. And the Japanese like this design when it comes to the faceplate kind of having a contour like this and sometimes the light uh, the light turn on is on the faceplate itself sometimes it's on the back of it in this case it's on the front and i added an led light i told i told uh, penny that i could add an led light and that really lights up the bed uh beautifully so we can see kind of what's happening down there uh at the needle as well and then this faceplate also opens so we can kind of get access to some of the key uh, lubrication points on this Japanese machine. And, uh, you know, let's just say that there's there's a lot of essential lubrication points in the faceplate. And I'm glad that this particular machine, when you open the faceplate, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a thread guide that's attached to the faceplate. And then it kind of becomes awkward, you know, as far as did I pull the thread out of position? Is it out of one of the thread guides? This one, you can open and close it if you want to get in there for some reason and make adjustments 
uh, or you can, uh, you know, do maintenance on the machine as well. What I was trying to say. This right up here, if you're not familiar with this design, it's it's a great design and it's very, very popular on Japanese uh, machines. This is going to be for uh, your presser foot pressure. And uh, again, if you push this outer ring right here, it will release all presser foot pressure. So you have no presser foot pressure whatsoever. Right now we got nothing. We got nothing. So if we were to try to sew right now, uh, we would barely get any material feed at all. And the stitching, even if we had it set at the longest stitch, the stitching would be real stubby. So if you've ever had stubby stitch issues where you set that stitch length at the longest point and you're getting stubby stitches or, or stitches or they don't look like they're full stitches, they don't look like they're complete. Um, you know, you're getting stitches like this row right here on this stitch off I did. This tiny little, let me shut off that light. That light's going to mess with it. You're getting tiny little stitches like this. And you should be getting stitches like this over here. That oftentimes is going to be a product of presser foot pressure because it's allowing that material to slip as it's going over the feed dogs and underneath the presser foot. So just be aware of that uh, as a troubleshooting issue if you experience that. And then as you are, are deciding, okay, what am I going to sew? Am I going to sew veg tan leather? Am I going to sew 100% cotton? Like this? Well, that wasn't it. Am I going to sew 100% cotton with this stiffener? Am I going to sew denim like this? That will decide how you set this presser foot control right here. When it's all the way up, we've got nothing. But as we push it down to right about there, we're going to be in the lighter range. We're going to be in the cotton, the silks, the satins, uh, fleece material, other things like that, that are really, really lightweight and have a tendency to bunch up and to pucker. We're going to want to make that presser foot pressure much lighter like it is right here. If we're moving into the leathers, then we push it down incrementally. See how it kind of goes down in stages? A little bit further down. A little bit further down, a little bit further down. Now we're into the heavy range. We might even use this heavy range right here if we're doing a lot of quilting with this machine because you've got multiple layers. You got the cotton, you got the quilt batting, and it's bulky. And feed is a major thing for that quilter as they're doing their, uh, their piecing or whatever it is that they're doing. So you might even go down to this range. You might even go a little bit further down. If we get into the elk hides, we get into the saddle grade leather. We might even get into this range right here. And if we just want max, absolute max presser foot pressure because of the thickness of the material, because of multiple layers, because of the density of the leather, whatever it is, we can even push this all the way down. And now we have maximum presser foot pressure. And if you push it down too far, as I've done sometimes, it's not a showstopper. You just push that little ring and you start over again, go down incrementally till you find that spot that you like and you're getting good results from. And as I sew cotton today with that uh, stiffener, I'll probably be right about in this range. And then as we step it up to do some of the heavier leather sewing, possibly, uh, I might bump it up a little bit higher. But that's just a quick little tutorial on how does this work? Because I've had experienced people, seamstresses and others that acquire a Japanese machine and they don't understand that. So if you encounter someone like that, you can explain it to them now so that they know how does that silly thing work? Why am I not getting any material feed right now? Why is the material not moving? Well, because there's no pressure foot pressure. Oh, now it's moving, but it's it's. You know, it's not feeding real well. What are you sewing? I'm sewing leather. I'm sewing multiple layers of denim. Oh, go ahead and push it down a little bit further. Yeah, maybe a little bit further. Yeah, good. Oh, you went too far. That's okay. We'll start over again. You guys get the idea. So it really is a great design. And it's very common on a lot of the Japanese models. And many Kenmores, too, adopted this. Because as most of you know, starting in the 1950s, around 1953, about four years before this machine came on the scene, the Kenmores and other machines were being made then over in, in Japan as well. 
So a lot of the common traits on those machines come into play. All right, some of the other walk around, and then we'll finally get into to doing a little bit of stitching on this. Feed dog drop is right over here. It's a simple push button. So right now the feed dogs are in the up position. If I want to do free motion quilting or freehand embroidery, I just push that, and then the feed dogs are dropped completely. There's also kind of a middle point when it's like this where it's going to lessen that, that feed dog pull a little bit. If you're sewing lighter, more fragile uh, fabrics, you can go to the kind of that mid-range where you might see that little red line there. And that's going to give you kind of a, 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 more, a softer touch on that material. But for our sewing purposes today, we're going to have those feed dogs in the up position all the time. So right up to this control right here, we've got stitch length, and we also have reverse. The Japanese love the big buttons right in the middle of the stitch length, and I don't blame them. It's, it's such an easy way to access reverse, isn't it? And on this machine, it's a little bit confusing the way the knob is set up, but we're, when we're on this solid line, if you can see that in the shot... There it is. That solid line is going to give us the longest stitch length. And then the way they have it set up, and I'm not going to turn this right now because I have the needle down in the material. But as you go to this direction here, where the dots become smaller and smaller and smaller, if I kind of get the camera over on that side, you'll see there's these little dots. And initially, they're kind of wide apart. Then they get smaller and smaller and smaller. As we go that direction, we can get more into uh, sewing at a range of somewhere around you know, 20 to 30 stitches per inch all the way down at the bottom. There it is. Our camera, our camera is kind of in Saturday mode today where it takes a while sometimes to focus. So we have to, we have to be patient with it, don't we? we got to be patient with it. Now up here, we've got an interesting little control area. Up here, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can do it holding the camera, but it might be a little bit tricky. Up here, on some of the Italian-made necky machines that were zigzag only, they still wanted to give people the ability to generate what would be almost ornamental stitches. So they wanted to give the sewist an opportunity to manipulate stitch width while they were sewing fairly easily. So they gave them this little bar right here, and I've got to pull that needle out of the material before I demonstrate this, otherwise I'm going to create a problem. So what they came up with is this little slider. And this little slider is designed that as you're sewing, if you choose to do it, you can manipulate that needle so that you can get different stitch outputs from that machine that look almost uh, ornamental. You can see as I'm moving this, moving that needle bar. Now you say, okay, that's all well and good. Right now, I can see that we're set on zero all the way at the left here. So we're going to be getting a straight stitch. What if I want to lock it in on one of these zigzag options over here? Do I have to hold onto this puppy while I'm sewing? Of course not. The Japanese are very smart. So what they came up with, and I'll try to do this one-handed again, is let's say I want to sew at the widest zigzag way over here in position four. Then I'm going to move my lever over, and then I'm going to push this little button. Now listen very carefully to what the, the sound of the machine locking it in place. Could you hear that? Then I can let go of it, and it's locked in place at the widest zigzag option that the machine has. Because holding it, that would be a little bit irritating, wouldn't it? That would be really, really irritating. And then when you want to release this, you can push that little button... And it goes all the way back to the zero point again. So you're sewing a straight stitch. And certainly you can lock it in at other positions like right there. And then release it as well. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, I think it's a, a good design. It's a very good design. I especially like that they added this, like the Necky machines, where you're able to generate not only a straight and a, and a zigzag, but you can also... Uh, you can generate variations of a zigzag that give that stitch a totally different look. Totally different look. 
So I talked a little bit about the branding of the machines. Initially, the Japanese machines, they're putting the badge mark right there on the front of the pillar. They're proudly telling everybody, this machine was made in Japan. And then when they realized the objections, then they moved it to the uh, inside of the pillar, the back of the pillar. And another place they sometimes would put it is right here underneath the motor mount, right over here. And over there again, it, it highlights the origin of the machine being made in Japan, but it's less conspicuous so that the average consumer, you know, the average consumers are looking at the machine. They're going to be looking at it like this. They're not necessarily going to notice. They're not necessarily going to notice that it's of Japanese origin. In if, in if, let me see if I can speak. In fact, when Penny brought this machine into the workshop and I immediately looked at it and I said, oh, it's a Japanese machine. She said, what? I didn't know that was a Japanese machine. So even she having this machine for a number of years didn't know the origin of the machine. So the Japanese were smart, you know, in reducing the objection factor in moving it more out of sight so that the average consumer wouldn't really pay attention to it. Yeah, there you go. Quick little summary of the machine of sorts. And uh, and certainly if you're maintaining a machine like this, you'll want to take off the top. There's a lot of lubrication points across the top of the machine, just like there is on the bottom of the machine as well. So, you know, maintain your machines well, and they will generally uh, take care of you. Okay. So finally, that's enough blah, blah, blah. Let me look at the chat real quick, and then let's let's put this machine to work a little bit, shall we? Let's put this machine to work. I love the interaction with all of you. I've got to say that. I love the interaction. Um, you get to know each other. You share things. You learn from each other. What a great classroom we have. So let me put on some Japanese music. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate this machine. We're not going to do a ton of sewing on it, but I do want to, I do want to sew with this machine. The thing that I'll tell you real quick about this particular model is I talked about the bobbin winder that I had had to retrofit. I had to retrofit this bobbin winder that was on a brother's sewing machine to this Japanese Fleetwood and it required re-drilling. I talked about all that earlier in the live stream. The big problem with this upper tension that arrived in pieces uh, to the workshop and was missing several parts is when you're going to mount uh, an upper tension like this in a machine like this, it's a two-stage process. First of all, you've got an inner core that the stem of the uh, upper tension is going to get mounted into, but you've got to mount that, that, uh, that base on the inside of the core of the machine first. And then you slide that stem in and then you anchor it into place. There's a, a screw that secures it just on the inside of the faceplate. But the diameter, when they uh, cast these machines, as far as getting that mounting base inside of the machine, so you can mount the rest of the upper tension unit to it, all of those are different circumferences. And most of the Japanese machines are going to be pretty common uh, as far as the um the size of that opening most of them are going to be i'll kind of show you most of them are going to be right around in the 15 to 17 uh size range and then again when you're sliding that little inner core in, it's going to slide into the machine and then you're going to anchor it into place and then you're going to mount the rest of the components of the upper tension in place the problem with this particular fleetwood from 1957 is that instead of having a more common opening like this, it has an opening right about like that. So as I was looking for replacement options to get onto this machine and put all of that assembly together, I had to come up with a solution that would work with an inner core mount like this, like this, instead of an inner core mount like that. Those of you that know me well, Paula, Emma, Roz, I sometimes will vent at you guys. You'll reach out to me just randomly and share something like in a text or whatever. You go, how you doing? I think I told Emma, I said, I am ready to, I shouldn't say this. Penny, I don't, I don't really mean this, Penny, 
But I got to a point where I was battling this and trying to get all of these pieces to fit properly together and to work properly together. And I think I said to Emma or Paula, I said, I'm at a point where I'm ready to hit this thing with a sledgehammer. I'm ready to hit this thing with a sledgehammer. Because ah! I just couldn't get it to work. All of these have to work uh, cooperatively. And I would get this part to work and then this part wouldn't work. And then the take-up spring wouldn't swing properly. It didn't have a large enough range of motion because this particular thread guide here is set uh, much higher than most of them. A lot of them, like on the Singer machines, when you lower that presser foot bar, uh, that lever on the back, this will actually drop so you get better thread movement as far as this take-up spring. This was in a, this one is in a fixed position, so I had to battle that as well. So I was getting adequate take up. It, it was I'll I'll stop there. Let's just say it was a challenge, but we won in the end. We won in the end. So for those of you that reach out occasionally, if you ever catch me venting a little bit, you'll have to forgive me for that because it, it is what it is, right? It is what it is. We sometimes have our battles when we're working with our VSM uh, machines, and we've got to overcome those. We got to overcome those. And the Japanese, while they were Japanese and, and folks from uh, that culture, usually, you know, they have things very uniform, very orderly, very predictable. This was the unicorn Japanese machine that they came out with. Oh, what am I? This Norton just popped up. Okay, close that. There we go. There we got it. Okay, so a little bit of music now. Since you've been listening to me, blah, 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 for a while. This is called Imperial Forces. And let's actually put this machine to work a little bit, shall we? Oh, let me tell you about the setup a little bit on this machine as well. Um, I have a Schmetz needle in here, but it's a slightly different uh, Schmetz needle. I'll show you guys real quick because I just I just ranted about it. Is I was trying to get initially way over here. Look at this is our lock stitch. You can kind of see as I was trying to get those that upper tension to work with all those components collaboratively and, and cooperatively. I went from this is a lock stitch way over here where it's not really a lock stitch at all, and then worked my way all the way across as I kept replacing parts on it, swapping parts in and out grinding some of the parts down a little bit so that they move better within the upper tension and you can just see the uh the progression across from right to left we're finally over here we had a lock stitch that was page 34 um and spot on so you just have to be patient as you're working with uh anything for that matter uh but particularly our vintage sewing machines so this is the one i'm using today it's a size 9014, but it's also because of the design of the needle, the the shaft, uh, the the contour of the scarf, the position of the uh, the needle hole itself, and then the point design on this as well. It's classified as a universal, but it's going to be a little bit different than the 9014 universal that we usually use. So I'll be interested to see how this one performs. And uh, when I when I sent some of the goodies to my buddy, Alex Askaroff over in the UK, he had mentioned to me in one of our conversations leading up to the interview that I did with him. And I want to make an honorable mention for Alex, because I know he's really excited about it as is his wife, Yana. And if you don't, if you don't know who Alex and Yana are, they're beautiful people that live over in the UK. Alex is uh, involved in a lot of the antique sewing machines, especially the hand cranks. That's kind of his sweet spot. But he's also a very prolific author, and some of you have probably bought his books. But he said to me, leading up to our interview, he said, Scott, over in the UK, needles are really, really pricey, and sometimes they're very scarce. So when I went to visit a customer one time, actually, I went to visit the customer's son. The father, who had done sewing machine restoration and repairs, passed away, and the son had a bunch of needles like this in these big, I think they're 10-packs. And I'd gotten a lot of these needles I purchased from this son. So I didn't tell Alex I was going to do it. But when I, when I mailed him his cap, like the one I'm wearing today in the live stream, and I mailed him some other goodies and I mailed a couple little goodies for Yana as well. Isn't Yana a beautiful name? That's Alex's wife's name, Yana, Y-A-N-A. -A. But I, I snuck in about five packs of these 10-pack uh, needles to Alex as well. 
And, you know, British people, they don't get emotional, but he reached out and he was a little bit emotional. He goes, you have no idea what this means. And I said, you know, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. We're friends and, and all of that. But anyway, any rate, this is the needle that Alex is using over in the UK now. Uh, Cause I mailed him uh, five packs of these. And this is the one that we're going to use today. So we'll see what we think of it. I, I usually use the other type, but maybe this will amaze us. Maybe this will amaze us. And then our thread is a common Coates and Clark uh, general type thread. It's nothing fancy. So now you know all the details. So let's do a little bit of sewing on this machine finally after all the blah, blah, blah. And what I'll show first, I think, is uh, some of this 100% cotton. This is from a fat quarter piece that I bought. I believe I bought it at Walmart. And um, just real thin, 100% cotton. And then I've got this stiffener in the in the middle that kind of acts almost like uh, quilt batting would act. So we'll see what we think of this machine. And listen to this machine run as well. Um, I think it's, it's a surprisingly quiet machine. <clears throat> and it does an excellent job now. Let me move these sew-offs to the side and get the camera a little bit closer so you can see this machine stitching away. Yeah, that's a pretty good shot. And because of the this this hood right here for the light is much lower than some of them that were more up in this range. We're not getting any of the weird wavy stuff on the screen right now. I don't want to I don't want to jinx us. But right now, because that hood is much lower, that LED light is pressing down on the bed and on the needle, and it's not affecting our camera shots. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our Japanese friends for making this hood lower so it's not interfering with our camera work today. All right. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. You're very sweet. Michelle wrote uh, in the chat, uh, she says, I, I like your blah, blah, blah. So, you know, some of my blah, 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 and we really share some interesting things together, don't we? I, I'm, I'm able to share some things and teach you guys about some things, you know, as I jump even between different machine makers and draw comparative similarities to those machines. And then you can go out into your circles of, uh, of VSM people or sewing people and share some of that blah, blah, blah with them. So we are just blah, blah, blahing all over the place. <laughs> all right so i'm going to lay down a straight stitch to begin and we'll probably do a couple of different lengths of it check my presser foot pressure <clears throat> and even though when i do this setup here kind of like if you're going with uh, quilt batting even though this is a light cotton our presser foot pressure is set right now about in the mid-range you can kind of see that i'm going to bump it up just a little bit so we get some nice even feed and we don't sacrifice the length of that stitch because again right now i've got it set on the longest stitch that this machine can generate there we go so we're going to be trying to do a long stitch and hopefully i've set it up correctly i've set it up properly all right i'm going to pause our japanese music for just a second listen to this machine run hopefully Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. All right. So pretty quiet in the workshop. And again, kind of like the, the machine that I just gave to uh, Kathy Pecor as the grand prize winner of our Calico contest, class 15 style machines that use that bobbin design and particularly the oscillating ones, because like Paula pointed out brilliantly, when you're dealing with an oscillating hook, the range of motion it's moving is less. It doesn't travel as far going back and forth. And so the demand it puts on pulling that thread is a little bit more aggressive. So if you're sewing with a machine similar to this, that's oscillating hook. And when you launch, once you get into your stitch flow, the stitching is gorgeous. And you're just going, it's, it's beautiful. But I always have this little weird bird nesting thing at the beginning of it. As I showed you with uh, Kathy's machine, when you're initially launching, just hold on to those threads in the back momentarily as that oscillating hook is grabbing that thread and demanding that thread saying, come over here, come over here. You know, hold on to that thread for a little bit. You'll feel it pulling against you and allow it to gradually go in. And then you should be able to avert uh, that little 
gobbledygook that I've gotten sometimes on these live streams because I forget to grab those threads. Now, in this instance where I have the camera real close, uh, I might cheat a little bit and rotate that balance wheel manually, kind of like you're seeing me doing right now, to get that initial stitch line going. And then once we're into the material, then I'll go ahead and let go of that thread. And we should be okay. Hopefully we're okay. So let's launch down this. Again, a straight stitch. And if you didn't notice it in the shot, let me show you one other thing. And this was classic of the Japanese machines. It does not have the capability of giving you a genuine center needle position. The needles on a lot of these Japanese machines is always going to be offset to the left. And they did that for seam purposes. Many of you that are much more gifted and knowledgeable sewers than I am uh, would be able to explain the huge benefits. Of why did the Japanese set it up with a left needle position as the most common setup on the machine? Um, you know, you can share that in the chat and let other people uh, have a, even a deeper understanding of the, the, the brilliant design of why they would do something like that. Oh, and welcome to... Um, Welcome to Mims as well. I think Mims, Mims may have said she was from Florida, but I don't recall exactly. But again, I know I, I know my leaders uh, will make everyone feel welcome. So that's good. All right. So let's give this a go, shall we? And listen again to uh, Penny's Machine Run. All right. Here we go. So I'm noticing, I noticed a little, just a moderate amount of puckering as this was feeding through. So that's telling me that I might have a little bit too much presser foot pressure. So I'm going to, you can see where we're at right now. I'm going to lessen this just a little bit. See if I go right about to there. Okay. We'll probably go right about here. I'll give this a go and see how it, how it feeds just a little bit more. There we go. So I had this down too far and I noticed as, as the material was feeding, we we're getting a little bit of a puckering effect on there. All right. Get that pulled around. But the machine laid down some really lovely stitching. I didn't do the most brilliant job in keeping it straight, uh, but I'll be able to show these stitches to you. I think I'll do a stitch row a little bit shorter. We'll kind of adjust that stitch length down, and then we'll launch down one more time. I cut this material way too big. You can kind of see that. But I'll give you an initial glimpse of the stitching that we just laid down. This is our top stitch, obviously. Move that camera a little bit more. I shut our light off. There we go. So some really lovely uh, page 34 stitching. And you notice as well, we've got a nice full stitch. It's not stubby, even though we're going through this, uh, this, uh, this stiffener that acts like a quilt batting. We're not getting a stubby stitch. We're getting a nice full stitch uh, all the way down. I've got a horrible angle. Let me sew that other line and then we'll look at this a little bit closer up. And also this is our lock stitch on the back. We've got a lovely, a lovely lock stitch as well. So, you know, fine tuning that presser foot pressure can be a little bit of a, a, of a craft, a little bit of a quest, especially if you're moving between uh, a diverse field of, uh, let me turn that light back on. If you're moving through a diverse field of materials like we do on these live streams, uh, well, well, we might have to do a little bit of tweaking on the presser foot pressure. We might have to do a little bit of tweaking as well on uh, the upper tension. So, oh, and I didn't mention, I apologize. I didn't mention, we we're talking about the, the bobbin down here. Let me kind of just show you again. You know, this oscillating hook system down here on the bottom. And the bobbin setup. The bobbin setup on this machine is when that thread is feeding, I'll just kind of show you on this one if I can. As, as you're, you're putting the bobbin case in your left hand generally, and you're holding the bobbin in your right hand, you're going to insert it like this into that bobbin case with the thread coming underneath. Initially, when I put this in, remember we had that, that quandary with Kathy's Handcrake 170th anniversary machine. I highlighted the machine was made in India, 
and they totally messed up the manual. They messed up the manual totally. They were telling you to insert the bobbin in a way uh, that was totally incorrect. They were telling you the flat side of the needle on that machine should go to the left. In fact, on Kathy's, it should go to the right. And I didn't mention that on this machine as well. This Japanese Fleetwood machine from 1957, the flat side on this needle goes to the right as well, just like Kathy's uh, 170th anniversary hand crank. But make sure you bring it underneath like this when you have the bobbin here and the bobbin, when you have the bobbin case here and the bobbin and you insert it in, the thread is underneath on the bottom. So it's going to be turning what way? I'm kind of turning it in front of you right now as it would turn inside of that bobbin case. Is it turning counterclockwise or is it turning clockwise? I'll just glance at the chat real quick. Yeah. Yeah, Roz, is, Roz was the first one, I think, to jump in, unless I missed somebody. Um, and Roz said counterclockwise, absolutely. And that that is a is a big deal when it comes to especially oscillating hook system machines. Uh, if you orientate that thread wrong in the bobbin case, you can encounter all kinds of problems with stitch quality. You can have uh, tilted stitches. You just run into all kinds of weird stuff. All right, let me do another stitch row, and this time we... We're going to shorten it up uh, a good distance. There we go. Put it like that. So off camera, see, I spoke too soon, and now, now it's doing that little waiver thing again. Oh, goodness. Let me see if I got the right spot here. There we go. Ah. <laughs> ah, you silly thing. Be nice. I'm doing my best. I didn't have any of that wavering thing that I spoke on a turn and I said, hey, look, there's no wavering. And all of a sudden it's wavering. There we go. We'll do it from this distance. See, it's just the angle on how it's picking up that light. Maybe we'll just have to... I'm just going to shut the light off. It'll be a little bit darker, but I could always turn the camera light on as well. There you can, there you can particularly see that stitch line, which... I think it's quite spectacular. It's quite spectacular. Anyone that says a Japanese clone machine doesn't stitch well, doesn't lay down a page 34 stitch, um, I totally disagree with that. It does a lovely job. So off camera, what I'm doing is I'm turning the stitch length uh, knob and I'm bringing us down to a shorter stitch. I'm not going to go crazy short, but we'll shorten it up a good distance. Right about there. I'm right at about uh, two and a half. Right at about two and a half. So let's give this a go and see what we think. All right, here we go. Any other thing, you know, depending on the setup of the machine with the foot controller versus knee controller, you can get a little bit of a run over too with that machine as well. Beautiful stitching. Wait till you see these. We're almost, I'm almost seeing a, a slight stubbiness with the top stitch, which could tell us that our bobbin case is turned up a little bit too high. Again, if you notice, if you if you look at the top stitch uh, on this shorter stitch, and then we turn it around and we look at the lock stitch, I'm kind of spinning it around. If the lock, lock stitch has a little bit better presentation, it looks fuller, it looks more robust, then that's telling you that that bobbin case is pulling down a little bit too hard. You can look at the fullness of this stitch line. Angle that camera down a little bit better. You look at the fullness of that stitch line that we just did. And then if we turn it over, you look at the stitch line. This again is our lock stitch. You look at the stitch line of the top stitch. You're going to notice that the stitches are a little bit more compressed. Let me spin it around. You can see that in the shot. It's a little bit more compressed, and that's an easy fix. That just means that we have to back off our either our bobbin case or we have to turn up our upper tension slightly. But again, it will it will vary depending on the length of the stitch that you're sewing and also the material setup as well. And there's nothing wrong with this top stitch. It's lovely. But as I scrutinize it, I can see that it's just a little bit more compressed than its counterpart on the back here. 
as you're looking at that stitch line. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, I always talk to you guys about constant and never ending improvement where some people would stitch off on this and just right away, you know, say, Oh, look at that. It looks, it's perfect. It looks great. And it does. Uh, we look at things in a positive way, but we also look at them with a vision of opportunity. We're always trying to make things better. We're going to be better tomorrow than we were yesterday. And that's that's how I run things in the workshop. We're always trying to improve things, aren't we? That's a good thing. It's what gets us up in the morning, gets us, gets us excited about life. So now let's lay down a zigzag next to this and see what we think of the zigzag with this machine. Okay, looking at camera position, that looks pretty good. And again, to set ourselves up for a zigzag, <clears throat> excuse me, all we're going to do is a quick little, let me take us over here, quick little adjustment over here, probably go to about a two or three, push our little button to, there we go, push our little button to lock it in. And then we have to decide on our stitch length, don't we? That's where we just sewed right there, right around two and a half, somewhere in that neck of the woods. Yeah, we'll probably go right about there. I usually try to match them. If I'm doing a two on the stitch width, if I'm doing a two on the stitch width, I'm usually going to do a two on the stitch length down here. So we're pretty close, two and two. Yeah. All right, let's see what we think of this uh, zigzag. And again, listen to this machine run. I shut the music off. It's a very smooth running machine. Here we go. Oops, I didn't have my take up arm all the way up. It didn't like that. It said, hello, hold on there, buddy. Hold on there, buddy. See a little bit of bunching, a little bit of bunching just behind there, which is telling me my, my presser foot pressure may be still a little bit on the heavy side. Maybe a little bit on the heavy side. Yeah, that's lovely. Lovely stitch. Let's take a look at this uh, zigzag as well. And again, I don't have any great experience working with this lever that allows us to generate other stitches. I think I've demonstrated in other videos, and I didn't do bad. And it takes practice, doesn't it, to get that rhythm down as you're actively sewing. But... Still, still gives you uh, a good opportunity to have some extra versatility with the machine, doesn't it? So you can kind of see the, the zigzag that we just laid down. Again, it's a two by two. We could have done a three by three. We could have done a, a four by four. Uh, or we could have done a one by one. I think I recently demonstrated that on one of the machines where we kind of did it in stages. We did a one by one, a two by two, a three by three, and then a four by four. But some beautiful stitches, the, the spacing, the integrity of the stitch is absolutely spot on. And so even though we're using a slightly different flavor of the Schmetz 9014 Universal Needle today, it's going to have a slightly different uh, shaft and scarf design on it and a point. It's doing a very good job, at least with this cotton. I'm not sure how well it'll do with the leather. We'll have to wait and see. But if we turn it over, we can take a look at that lock stitch as well. And you can get a glimpse of that lock stitching on here also. And we got some good balance right now between top and lock as far as that tension. So I'm not going to make any drastic changes, drastic changes to that. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of presenting this to you a little bit differently. I'm presenting it to you horizontally where normally I'll put it on one of the stitch off holders and maybe i should do that as well because what you see may be a little bit different let's do that right now so that was our lock right you know i got to keep this keep this orientated correctly i'll just show you all the stitches together because it's not that not that huge And again, I didn't sew perfectly straight, but the stitch quality 
Um, the caliber of the caliber of the stitching is absolutely impressive with this uh, Japanese clone machine. It did a really, really nice job. Then our lock stitch. Yeah, it looks like I was it looks like I was sewing downhill, doesn't it? A little bit. So some very, very good looking stitching on this initial sew off that we did. We did a, a full size uh, straight stitch and then we did more of a uh, compressed type st uh, straight stitch. This is probably somewhere in the range of about 10 to 10 to 12 stitches per inch. And then we finally did this uh, this little zigzag next to it. All in all, we got good feed, so our pressure for pressure is not way off. But I did see at certain points when we got around to the middle section where we we're getting a little bit of puckering. So just keep that in mind if you're sewing on the lighter side of things and you get a little bit of puckering or the material seems like it's kind of bunching a little bit, just reduce that pressure for pressure and you should be good to go. But all in all, quite good, quite good. And again, uh, there are some camps... There are some camps that are really, really negative on Japanese clone machines, and it's a shame. They really miss out on the the greatness of what these machines what these machines can offer. Yeah. It's actually a little bit harder to see at that angle, but I'll throw this to the back. I think, I don't think I could try that adjuster thing, but I don't know how well I'm going to do with it. And I might end up breaking a needle. I hope I don't. I'll give it, I'll give it a go just to be courageous. All right. Well, in order to do that, I've got to take out our zigzag. And then while I'm sewing, I'm going to be doing my best to try to manipulate this lever going back and forth and we'll see what kind of stitch line I get. I'll be, um, I'll be interested to see how well I do with this. I'm, I don't lower your expectations just a wee bit as we give this a try. Okay. <laughs> and I'll move the camera back a little bit so you can see me try to manipulate this a, a bit as we're going. There we go. All right. Let me just lower this down a wee bit. There we go. And that should be far enough back. I can, I think I can turn that. Well, that's actually takes away from it, doesn't it? It's so bright. We'll leave the light off for now. Okay, let me give us a try. But again, this is something that um, Neki love building this into their zigzag machines to give a little bit more options to the soloist. We'll see what we think of this. Yeah, thank you, Emma. Emma gave me the the battle cry. She said, "Go for it." And if you don't know, Emma is originally from Brooklyn. I don't know if we have any other Brook folks in the, the live stream or not. But, you know, when Emma and I have talked over the phone, she doesn't sound like she's from New York. She doesn't. But, you know, once in a while, I'll shoot her a quick little uh, uh, Brooklyn, you know, uh, gif or something like that, you know, in a in a text or something. And that always gets her going. And then she'll break into her stories, kind of like Bill O'Rourke. If you guys didn't know it, my buddy Bill O'Rourke uh, and Emma are also folks that grew up in the great state of New York and specifically in Brooklyn. So, all right, let's give this a go and I'll do my best, do my best. All right. I'm a little bit nervous. You guys, I'm just going to be honest with you, a little bit nervous, but if I break the needle, I got more needles. So here we go. Let me just get that going initially. You can avoid that little bird nesting at the end. We'll kind of start in the down position. There we go. Coming up. There we go. All right, give this a go. Here we go. I don't know what I made. It almost looks like a kind of a weird blind hem stitch. Just kind of show you what I just made here. Hey, 
And again, it takes, it takes skill, technique, and practice to perfect something like this, where you can really create some interesting stitch patterns. And certainly also the other thing that in retrospect that I should have considered, but I didn't, is I left the stitch length at about two and a half because that's where we did this zigzag right here at two and a half. But I should have shortened this up a little bit more because as we compress the length of that stitch a little bit, it's going to give us better uh, stitch presentation. It's going to show the form of that stitch a little bit better, isn't it? But all in all, interesting. I, I, I just randomly was trying to try at doing this and I did two, then I did three, then I did like two and a half, and then I did four. So I was very random, wasn't I? I was like creating, that was totally intentional, totally intentional. Uh, not, nah, no, it wasn't, not even close. So, but you get an idea of what, you know, someone that really practices at this, you could develop un, almost unlimited stitches, a, a simple zigzag sewing machine using that lever. And I would have to ask one of my leaders to, to do some research to confirm this, but I believe that that lever originated with the Necky Sewing Machine Company. I think they were one of the first ones, the Italians were one of the first ones to say, we're not going to add a coffee grinder to the back like, uh, you know, like, uh, like Foff did with their 130-6s. We're not going to add, you know, this or that. We're going to give you a simple little lever and you're going to be in the driver's seat. You're going to be able to decide when you move that lever, how fast, and depending on the rate of sewing, what kind of pattern you're going to be able to operate. But you can imagine if we did this with a shorter stitch length and I was more uh, experienced and skilled using that lever, we could create some beautiful stitch patterns. Don't you agree? Some real beautiful stitch patterns. So, you know, whether it started with it, you know, I think it started with the Italians, but wherever it started, kudos to someone saying, let's take that zigzag machine to a new level. Let's give that sewist that has creative spark the capacity to say, I'm going to create my own stitches. I don't need a machine that has multiple stitches. I can make unlimited stitches using that lever or lever. Is it lever or lever? I have no idea. But whatever it is, that was my weak attempt, my one-off in demonstrating what Penny's machine has the ca uh, capability to do. So kind of cool. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> oh, let me show you the lock, the lock stitch on that as well. Get that to the back. Let me let me just put it up on the uh, stitch off holder. That's probably easier, isn't it? It only takes a second. <clears throat> okay, that should be our top stitch. I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> Right about there, I think, should be pretty good. So top stitch and lock stitch. And you can kind of see what I was talking about. You got just a little bit of puckering on the back of here, and that's a product of presser foot pressure. Also, I can see more definition on the lock stitch as well, which is telling me when we're executing uh, a stitch with needle swing, especially when I'm swinging the needle using that lever, we, we might want to back off that upper tension just slightly and give a little bit of this definition to that top stitch. And I'll leave the rest of this field of uh, material here uh, for Penny to uh, to goof around with it and have a little bit of fun. So let me throw that to the back. Let's try stitching a little bit of leather with this machine now. We haven't done any leather with it. And I've got some good old uh, elk hide here. I cut kind of a big piece because I figured that I would put on some Japanese music and we could kind of buzz around with a little bit. And... I think we'll be able to see the lock stitch okay, but this does have a very pronounced uh, nap on it with this elk hide. And for those of you that don't know, I know most of you already know, but elk hide is chemically processed just like uh, protected full grain leather is. This leather as well, this blue leather is protected full grain leather. This is also processed as well. And uh, when they process leather, it's to protect it from staining, to make it a little bit more durable, 
But what it does is it kind of fortifies that surface a little bit. So the piercing threshold when you're sewing materials like this that are chemically processed, whether it's the elk hide or the protected full grain leather, that needle is going to have to work a little bit harder to get through it. But this is a very strong Japanese machine. Um, the motor strength, let me see if I can look real quick. Looks like about a point, a point eight amp motor is what we have on the back of this machine. So that's more than enough strength to manage whatever we do as far as this. So let's give this elk hide a try first. I'll just kind of, you know what? Let me cut it in half because we have, I don't have the 1812 overture, although I could turn that on. Maybe I will. Let's do that. That's become a little bit of a, a classic for me as I like to put on the 1812 overture when we're sewing different things. Let's give that a go. <clears throat> I'll take a quick peek at the chat too to see if I'm missing anything. <clears throat> Let's see. There we go. Nope, we're good. All right, let's give this a go. Let's just kind of buzz around and have a little bit of fun here. And I'm going to sew right at about a, probably the stitch length right around, right around a two, which I think is going to give us about, probably about eight to 10 stitches per inch, somewhere in that neck of the woods. All right, let's get into this. 1812 Overture. Cut these threads real quick. I'm actually going to change my stitch length. I don't, I don't dislike the appearance of this stitch length, but I'm going to make it a little bit fuller. Hold on. Yes.
<laughs> oh, that's fun. Probably ran out of thread. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, man. I did some crazy stuff on the back of here. This is cool. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It's like being a little kid in the sewing room. It's being like a little kid in the sewing room and your mom tries to give you this special thing to do and all you want to do is run in a circle. This is our equivalent to being a little kid and running in a circle. Right? Yeah, why not? And our lock stitch as well. A little bit hard to see it because of the nap, but you can kind of get a, you can probably get a little bit of a glimpse of it. So once again, anyone that is a, you know, a downer when it comes to Japanese clone machines, let this live stream stand as a testimony as a proclamation, as a declaration of these machines having the capacity for greatness. They do. They have the capacity for greatness. And you notice even the way that this machine managed that feed of the material, this is not a light material. This is about three to four ounces of genuine elk hide. It's a heavy leather. And this machine fed it and, and gave it grace underneath the needle as we were manipulating it to the 1812 overture so I've, I've had a couple of customers over the years that have reached out and said you know i was hold on a second they said i was a i was an elna snob or i was a huskavarna snob or i was a singer snob or whatever you want to be snobby about and watching your channel it all of a sudden humbled me and opened my eyes to any machine can have greatness any machine including newer machines like the ones that i'm getting a lot of from uh joann's out of marinette wisconsin so let this for those of you that are watching this right now if you've been a snob about japanese clone machines give them a try give them a try yeah cool all right that was fun that was very fun. I am a kid at heart. Well, the other thing I, I should have pointed out, and I didn't, and this is uh, this is for the benefit also of Penny. When Penny uh, sent this machine to the, when she dropped it off at the workshop, I should say, it had, um, and this is unusual. I've, I don't know that I've seen many of these. This is part of the rewiring. Um, It had a needle plate that would not accommodate the, the zigzag function of this machine. And also a presser foot that would not accommodate the zigzag function of this machine. This was the, uh, the, the feed dog, the needle plate that it had on it when it came in. And I thought, what a what a travesty. What an absolute travesty. Even if the sewist is not going to be using it very often for zigzag, what if they want to do a zigzag? And so I swapped. I, I'm going to give this back to Penny. And I'll check with her when she comes to the workshop. Maybe I somehow missed it and she has a different needle plate cover. But why would you have such a cool machine that can do a zigzag? Plus, you got that lever as well, where you can generate your own stitches and not be able to generate them because the needle plate and the throat plate opening, the throat plate opening won't accommodate it. So if you have a Japanese clone machine and you get it and it has a throat plate like this, get a different throat plate so that you can enjoy the fullness of that machine. Just like the presser foot as well that it came with was just a standard, you know, straight stitch type presser foot. So 
Yeah. What you get is not what you're stuck with. And I know you guys are smart enough to know that, but some of our viewers, you know, might not have the scope of understanding that you do. And they're like, well, I guess it is what it is. It should be able to do it, but it can't because it's got the wrong needle played. And so, yeah, just change it out, change it all like, like I did. And, and that way we, when we play with this machine during this live stream and we learn about this machine, we can enjoy the fullness of it. Just makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. All right, so let me throw that to the side. So what am I going to sew next? What should I sew next? Maybe I should try a little bit of denim. We'll try a little bit of denim. And we'll go through multiple layers of that. And I'll lay down a zigzag on it. Why not? So I've got two layers that I'm kind of starting with. And this is not that stretchy denim. This is a... Uh, Well, it sounds musical. It sounds better than my my bugle playing of taps, that's for sure. So, but yeah, this is, uh, we'll do, let's see, two. On uh, when I broke uh, the hand crank that I gave to Kathy Pecor, the, the replica, I tried to do six. I think we can get away with six on this one. I believe we can. So I've got two, I've got four, and then I've got six layers of denim. Yeah, and if I'm wrong, I'll go to four. But I, I think we can do this. I'm pretty sure we can do this. Yeah. And the only thing you have to kind of prepare for is we've just made it quite a bit thicker than any of other saw. So we're going to make an adjustment up here. And we're going to go to max presser foot pressure for a saw off like this. Pushing it all the way down. Yeah. Okay. Then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to, I think we'll be okay on uh, our lock stitch tension, but I'm just going to very, very slightly. Oh, yeah. My presser foot lever is down. When you adjust a tension like this, just a quick tip for you. Always make sure that your lever in the back is in the down position. You can see that. Yeah. And the reason you want to have it in the down position is if it's in the up position, it's pressing out to release the tension on those discs and it's pressing against the knob you're trying to turn. So don't fight against it. Drop that lever down as if you're getting ready to sew and then adjust your tension then just slightly up. Just go a little bit up. I don't want to take too much away from the top stitch. Okay. Oh, and we have to choose our zigzag now. So we're going to go right around to probably about a three. Lock that into place. And then we're going to go to, you know, in the three range over here, probably about two and a half. Right about, yeah, right about, right about there. So we have almost a three and three match between the two. Uh, we've got our stitch width set on three up here. Locked in. We've got our stitch length set on three right over here. A little bit below three. We'll see how the machine manages this. There we go. Okay. So, and again, and a tip to any of the folks watching this live stream or watching the video afterwards. Right now, I'm not in an optimal position as far as our take-up arm. You see where it is? It's on the the downstroke, or I, I I can't tell if it's downstroke or upstroke, but at any rate, it's it's in a position right now where the natural mechanics and the gears of this machine are going to be binding against each other, trying to launch. If the machine is in motion, it's fine. But when you try to launch with the take-up arm at a lower position like this, it's going to cause binding and you might get bird nesting. The, the machine just won't launch properly. So we've got to bring this all the way to the highest position and the highest position where it's just getting ready to go on the downstroke. Just getting ready to go on the downstroke. Let me see if I can position the camera so I can uh, show you. Yeah, I think I can.
All right. Right now it's at the, to use a fancy word, it's probably a dollar twenty-five word. Right now the take-up arm is at the pinnacle, and it's just slightly off camera. Right now the take-up arm is is at the highest point, and it's just getting ready to. I can show you. Just getting ready to come on that downstroke. See that? This is the sweet spot to launch at on any sewing machine, with the exception of some uh, chain stitch machines. Some chain stitch machines, you actually have to take the presser, uh, the uh, the take up arm at a lower position to avoid binding. It's because of the mechanics of some of those, especially the ones that have uh, uh, transverse transverse uh, vibrating shuttles. Uh, the mechanics are totally different on them, so you've got to sometimes lower that. You'll, you'll figure it out. You'll find out based on the machine. But if you have launch problems, always take a look at that take-up arm. Okay, so six layers of heavy-grade denim is what we're going to attempt now. And we'll see how this machine does with that. I'm just going to look real quick at... No, that makes sense. That makes sense, Paula, what you're saying about it optimizing the um, the straight stitch. But really, if with a plate like this, if if the machine is adjusted properly and the needle bar and everything are in true alignment, the plate shouldn't be as big of a factor as some circles try to make it to be. I'm just being honest with you. Um, you can have more of a universal... Uh, throat plate opening that will accommodate straight and zigzag and you're going to get you're generally going to get very good feed with it if the feed dogs are adjusted properly if the presser foot pressure is adjusted properly and if the sewers can sew straighter than i do which is pretty much everybody so but it's it's a it's a point well taken and i know that there are a lot of circles of thought that believe in making adjustments to the throat plate cover uh, based on the sewing that you're trying to do. So, all right, blah, 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 blah. Let's give us a go. I'm just going to back it up just a tiny little bit. There we go. All right, so I'm going to verify that take-up arm again. We are on the downstroke. So let's see how it does with the six layers. Yeah. I might just clip this so I get a little bit of a benefit in keeping it semi-straight. All right, here we go. And right at the climax of the 1812 Overture. I did not plan that. I did not plan that. All right, here we go. There we go. Well, needless to say, six layers was not a challenge for this Japanese clone machine. It certainly was a challenge for that replica machine that I broke on that live stream, but I fixed it later. Yay. Yay, yay, yay. You can break stuff, and then if you fix it, all is good. Kathy was very happy. I don't know if any of you, any of you do the Facebook stuff, you saw that little video clip I did of Kathy loading the machine in her car. She was so happy. She was so happy. And I even had uh, some of the city officials that reached out afterwards and said that they uh, watched that video, um, the one on YouTube and the other one as well. So that's kind of cool. Small town people get excited about, you know, the things that are happening. So this is our top stitch. Let me set this on the sew-off holder and let's take a look at this. Again, six layers of heavy grade denim is what we just sewed. And again, if you want to be reminded of the thickness of it, that's what we just sewed through right there. All right, this is our top stitch. Let me actually set it up here. Oops. As I'm dropping things. Stay. Please stay there. Don't move. Don't move. All right. So again, we did a, what a, close to a three by three zigzag. So we weren't at full range. There we go.
Beautiful stitching. Beautiful stitching. And I don't know if I have the ideal angle of this, but it gives you an idea. And again, we're talking about six layers of heavy grade denim, so it's not a super light sew-off either. It definitely is not a light sew-off. All right, let's turn it over and look at the lock stitch. Hopefully this will stay up there. And again, I'm holding the camera with the left hand, so I'm trying to balance this with my right hand, and hopefully I've, I've done a fairly decent job of doing that. And on the end here, it's a matter of how the material is uh, is puckering right now. It's not laying flat. It's not laying flat. So the stitches are nicely aligned and everything. But because of the position of the material, it kind of throws things off a little bit. So totality of the stitching. I'm going to give it an absolute page 34. It managed... What is a fairly difficult uh, sew off, six layers of heavy grade denim, uh, and it managed it beautifully with the top stitch. And also, there we go. Now I have it almost straight. Top stitch and the lock stitch as well. And laid down some very, very lovely stitching. I, I don't know if this, this other type of 9014 needle does quite as well as my regular one, but it does a good job. It does a very good job, but just realize the science of needles, depending on the shaft design, the long groove, uh, the scarf, the point, and everything else on that needle, slight changes can affect your uh, your stitch output and your stitch the clarity of the stitch as well. So um, I'm not opposed to these needles, but I, I may stick with my other ones uh, just to ensure consistent results. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So we've done so far, we haven't done a lot of sewing, but I told you guys we weren't going to be doing a ton of sewing on this Japanese clone. We did this uh, on the 100% cotton with a stiffener. We did my own stitch design using the lever on the far right. We did a standard zigzag. We did a more uh, tiny uh, straight stitch. And then finally, we did a straight stitch uh, that would be more full length on this particular machine. And we got some really, really good results, both for the top stitch and the lock stitch uh, as well. Then we launched into me being a kid and sewing in a circle to the 1812 Overture and really created a quite a lovely piece here. I'm almost tempted to see if I can negotiate this away from penny and see if i can frame this and kind of put it up on the workshop wall because I, I it's just kind of fun it's like those kaleidoscopes or whatever those things were called where you could create you know you would have a, a pencil or whatever it was in a fixed position and then you could you know you guys know what i'm talking about whatever those things were called you could create just beautiful designs and uh this is kind of cool kind of cool and again, the machine managed uh, the feeding of the material also beautifully as well with this elk hide. And then we just did this uh, six layers of heavy grade uh, denim uh, as well and generated some lovely, lovely stitching uh, with this as well. And again, the replica, the replica could not handle this. And it just goes to show that through the ages, when you uh, try to reproduce a machine, uh, the capabilities of that machine have to be adjusted slightly, don't they? So lovely stitching by this uh, Japanese clone. So let me see what else I have, and then I can kind of get you to chime in and say, what do you want to see? I've got some of this. 
having to sniff it. I call this veg tan leather, but I'm looking at the nap a little bit closer now. This might be just a nappier veg tan leather, but this also could be uh, cowhide. Some of those are hard to tell sometimes, but it's probably about, it's a little bit thicker than the elk hide. It's probably about four ounces, especially as you get on this end over here. So we can sew this leather, I'll just call it leather, because I'm kind of divided now as to whether or not it's veg tan or whether it's cowhide. I'm inclined to say cowhide because of the, the nap style on it. And then we've got some of this protected full grain leather. And we've got some bubble gum material. And if you're new to the channel, this is why we call it bubble gum material. It's got a high concentration of vinyl in it. We've got saddle grade leather. We've got some of this Naga hide, which is a fake leather. And I've got two layers uh, of that Naga hide material as well that we could possibly sew. And that's all I prepared. I could have pulled out the acrylic fiber. I could have pulled out some other types of leathers that I have. I could have pulled out some, uh, some vinyl, but this is the pile that I ended up setting up for these, uh, for this, uh, uh, this, Japanese clone machine. So I'll look at the chat if you want to, if anyone wants to chime in and say, hey, could you do it? Could you do this one next? Or maybe even lay out an order of what we should do. You know, the Naga hide, saddle grade, protected uh, full grain leather down here, cow hide, or the bubble gum material. We basically have one, two, three, five, five potential sew offs left that we can do to create our sew off sandwich our sewing Olympics on uh, Penny's 1957 uh, Japanese clone machine. So I'll let you guys decide. I'll kind of look at the chat and see if anyone chimes in with a strong voice of what we should sew and in what order. Oh, yep. Paula's got to step away. Bye, Paula. Have a great day, dear. Have a great day. Enjoy your uh, Memorial Day weekend and uh, stay safe. And it uh, looks like we're greeting uh, Mikey. Yeah, we're greeting Mikey. I don't know. Mikey must be. Oh, I see it now. Mikey Potts. Isn't Potts a great name? Pot, the last name of Potts is just a fun name to say, isn't it? Mikey Potts. What a classic, cool name. All right. So it looks like I only have one vote, unless I missed something. Uh, Emma's saying, let's do the Naga Hide. Let's do the Naga Hide. So we'll do the Naga Hide. And I'll just put on some random music now. I'll turn the volume down. And this is a pop song called As You Fade Away, As You Fade Away. It's not on my top 10 list, but you never know. It could be. Welcome to Aaron as well. Great to have Aaron here also. So I'm going to start with the Naga hide, and then if anybody else that just joined the live stream wants to chime in, what I have left that we could sew, and we don't have to sew all these, we could. Oh, this is rap music. Cool. So we got bubble gum material, saddle grade leather, Naga hide, which was Emma's pick, so I'll move that up here. And then we got protected full grain leather, and then we have cow hide. So this is what we have left. Let's go ahead and look at this uh, Naga hide stuff. See what we think of that. And this stuff tends to be a little bit slippery, so I'm probably going to use some of my little clips to hold it together, at least initially. All right, press your foot is down. I'm not going to make any. I'm not going to make any changes with this having a high concentration of vi vinyl. Plus, it has this uh, background as this uh, this uh, backing as well, which is kind of almost an upholstery style backing that you see a lot when they're covering uh, furnitures and that. This is going to be real slippery. These are going to have a tendency to move around. 
So I'm going to maintain the presser foot pressure at max for right now. Hopefully it doesn't throw us off too much. I'm not going to make any changes to the upper tension. We, we bumped that up a little bit when we did our last sew off. So we're going to launch with this. Hopefully we get a great outcome. I'm also going to leave it for right now on the zigzag. You see right now we're set on around a three uh, for the zigzag. I might, you know what, though? No, I might bump it down to a two zigzag just because the needles swing through two layers of a material that, uh, two layers, yeah, of a material that has a high concentration of vinyl. I'm going to reduce that needle swing maybe just a, just a tiny little bit. Although we're pretty close to, two, eh, I'm going to leave it. We're at two and a half. I'm going to leave it at two and a half. And then we're right around uh, two and a half or so on stitch length uh, also. So let's see how it does in managing this Naga hide. Not an easy sew off. Not an easy sew off. All right. One of my ridiculous clips. These are huge, aren't they? Paula sent me some smaller ones, and I always forget to set them up and grab them. So we'll see how this machine does. Also, make sure my take-up arm is at the highest position. It is. All right. Let's give this a go. See what we think. All right, here we go. All right, get my little clip off because I don't know if it's going to clear that needle clamp or not. Yeah, even, even though I tried my best to hold this together, and even though we bumped up the presser foot pressure, this vinyl Naga hide stuff is really kind of a nightmare to sew. I can see that we got quite a bit of slippage as I was trying to feed this through. We got quite a bit of slippage and it throws off the consistency of the needle uh, of the, uh, the stitch presentation. We can look at that closer when we actually set it up. But our, our call as far as the tension when you're sewing two layers of this, see, I'm letting go of it now. You see what I'm saying? When you're sewing something like this, it's a real tricky proposition to try to get some real consistent uh, stitch, stitch presentation, especially when you're laying down a stitch that has needle swing to it. So we did our best. It wasn't the machine's fault. It's just our setup. Our setup and um, just the, the way this material just manipulates that stitch output. Isn't that a hoot? Yeah. I might actually display this one laying down because it good luck trying to get it to set on the uh, the stitch off holder. It's not going to work. Maybe I'll just hold on to it. That's probably the easiest thing to do. All right. So this, this is our top stitch. And again, you're going to notice variation in the stitch because we're dealing with two layers of vinyl. Let me see if I can hold it still for you. And it's not a bad looking uh, zigzag. It's just not consistent. But the thing I'm incredibly pleased about with this needle that I'm using not being as proven as my regular 90, 9014, we didn't have a single skip stitch. And that's sewing with needle swing going down two layers of this Naga hide, super high concentration of vinyl. And all in all, the stitch quality is quite, quite good. I would give it a provisional page 34. Turn it over. Is there a lock stitch? The lock stitch is actually, I would give this a higher rating than our top stitch. Uh, the machine managed it a little bit easier, but that makes sense because when it's laying down the top stitch, the movement of that material is going to have a bigger effect than on the bottom. All in all, some really, really good stitching with a very tough, tricky sew off on this Naga hide material. And we could have we could have cut the corner a little bit by sewing a single layer. I chose to sew two layers because it raises that difficulty level 
uh, even higher. But again, when you're sewing a material like this, you would be better off using a roller or a walking foot so you can try to reduce the inconsistency as far as the stitch presentation where some are a little bit wider, some are a little bit more narrow. That's just the product of the feed. All in all, really quite excellent. Don't you agree? It's a lovely stitch. Lovely stitch off and very tricky. And also, it's, it's not done curling yet either. Look at that. It's not done. <laughs> All right, let me look at the chat real quick. Yeah, Aaron, this is out of... Um... This is a little bit later than your model, I think, Aaron. So uh, it's possible by then they had more metal resources, but this this also could have been made from uh, salvaged uh, Navy vessels also like a lot of the others. So, all right, I didn't see anyone else chiming in as far as uh, what to sew next. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut down this bubblegum material and uh, I could just fold it too, couldn't I? Let's just get that into position like that. All right, I'm going to go down this with a zigzag just like I did the last one. Take a arm all the way up. There we go. And hold that thread for just a moment. All right, let's try this bubble gum material. And I'm going to do my best to hold it together. I'm not going to clamp it. I probably should. I probably should clamp it, but I... I'm just going to go for it. We're dealing with a lot of materials that have a high concentration of vinyl, the Naga hide, and now this bubblegum material as well. So I'm going to take it nice and slow, try to get our stitch line down, and then we'll see if we can lay down a straight stitch next to it as well. All right, here we go. All in all, I did better with that as far as keeping it fed straight. And when I did a better job, the, ma the machine can do a better job uh, as well. We'll look at this in just a moment. I'm gonna lay down a straight stitch next to it now. And we're gonna wrap this live stream up pretty quick. We've got other leather that we could sew, but we've sewn a fair amount of leather already. We've done a fair amount already, so. All right, I'll lay down a straight stitch next to this, and then we'll wrap this up. All right, so the adjustments I'm going to make on the machine real quick. And look at that stitcher. I've got to give you a preview of it. It's just absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. And this is an equally tricky material to sew because of that vinyl concentration but look at how it managed that consistency and presentation of that, that zigzag all the way down. Oh, there, now you can see it. I almost was there. All right, let's do this straight stitch and I'll show you, show you both at the same time. All right, so off camera, I'm pushing that little button here, I'll show you. Off camera, I'm gonna, on camera, blah. I'm going to push this button so we're back to a straight stitch. There we go. And again, whenever you're adjusting this, make sure you have your needle out of the material. And then we're going to make our stitch length just a wee bit longer. Right about... Now let's go max. I've got it on max now. So straight stitch, max stitch length. Let's see what we get. Oh, there you can see that stitch quite nicely. Isn't that lovely? Beautiful stitch, beautiful, beautiful stitch. All right, let's do a straight stitch on this. We'll wrap this uh, premiere up, premiere live stream. There we go. 
And again, we're sewing with a left needle position because that's the way this machine is set up. Here we go. It's really trying to tame that speed back. This machine has a lot of get up and go of you don't tame it back just a wee bit. Yeah, again, our upper tension might be a little bit high, but we're getting some beautiful stitches. Wait until you see these. I think we'll wrap up our live stream after this sew off. Unless someone really says, I want to see you sew the protected full grain leather. How well can you see it right there? Let's see. Actually, pretty well. We'll put it on the stitch off holder. It's a little bit easier to see. Okay, so this again is bubblegum material, high concentration of vinyl. We're looking at the first stitch row, the zigzag we did, and then we'll look at the uh, straight stitch right after that. Or we can look at both at the same time. That would make more sense. Duh! There we go. Beautiful stitching, a solid page 34. I'm going to come out a little bit and show you the totality of the stitching. And again, if anyone wants to reach out and say, could you send me a sample of that bubblegum material? I'll be glad to do it. Very good looking stitching and a very difficult sew off too. Let's turn it over. Look at that lock stitch. Hold on a second. I'm gonna get. I've got to clip that down because it's gonna to try to fall off. There we go. So this again is our lock stitch. Well, a lock stitch going through two layers of bubblegum material, high concentration of vinyl. Folks, I'm seeing a page 34 plus stitch on this one. I hope you agree. It is absolutely wow. Once the camera focuses, it'll be wow. There we go. I was trying to hold the camera real still so we could get it to focus properly. There we go. So again, beautiful, beautiful stitching by this Japanese clone machine from 1957. Um, just gonna show you again what we've done and then we'll wrap this up. Cause I think we've, uh, we've definitely put this through the paces through a, a a wide field of sew-offs and this machine has done an excellent, excellent job. So once again, we kind of started with, that leather is getting all over this. We kind of started with 100% cotton, kind of a basic baseline with a stiffener in it. And uh, this machine did an absolutely brilliant job in uh, managing that sew-off. Top stitch and lock stitch as well. There we go. 
Then we also did this to the 1812 Overture. Again, this is genuine elk hide. Created a cute little picture of thread. Again, some pretty thick stuff. Then we went from that and we did, I think we did the uh, genuine uh, heavy duty denim stuff then. Six layers of that. Laying down beautiful, beautiful zigzag both sides as well. We then did this nasty stuff, this Naga hide stuff, which is trying to be a slinky right now. It wants to be a slinky. And we got some really good results. A little bit of inconsistency, but that's just a product of trying to sew two pieces of Naga hide together without clipping them together in any way. We're just kind of feeding them and, and they've got slippery backs on them and they have a tendency to slip a little bit. So it throws off, throws off the consistency of that stitch just a little bit. There we go. But still a beautiful, beautiful stitch output. Beautiful stitch output, both on that side and then also this side as well. And then last but certainly not, see that that stuff won't even lay when we're on camera. Look at that. It's just going, I don't I don't want to do that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna come on, be nice. You're on camera. Come on. All right, we're going to put the denim on top of it, see if that helps. Give me an idea of how, look at that, that's ridiculous. It's, a little, it's become a bridge, and it's holding up six layers of heavy-grade denim. It gives you an idea of how much vinyl is in that Naga Hide stuff. It's crazy, isn't it? Just crazy. And then last but not least, we did this bubblegum material, also very high in uh, vinyl as well. But we were able to deliver and get stitch quality that is just absolutely break worthy. Once I get the camera to, there we go. So I'm going to declare, I'm going to declare <clears throat> that this Japanese clone from 1957, number one, it's definitely got greatness. Number two, it, it dispels the myth that Japanese clone machines are not machines that you can count on in delivering great, great stitch outcomes. See that, it, this elk hide is just molting, just molting all over the place. Ah. So it's always good to, to see a machine get to this level, get to this level. And we could do more sewing, but I'm going to stop at this point and just say that this is our sew-off sandwich for this live stream. And I'll let you guys wrap up some conversations that you might be in the middle of. I love to see the sharing as you guys are sharing things back and forth, getting acquainted. And as others feel comfortable in stepping out of the, out of the shadows into the light and joining the live chat, that would be brilliant. And I do have this on, on chat replay. So you can go back later if you want to say, well, what did they say about that? And you can look at the chat and it actually goes in sequence with the, the video as well. So you can kind of see the conversation as well. And others that couldn't join the live stream, you have the opportunity to go back and and see what kind of see what kind of conversations we had. Boy, that, I've got hat hair right now. <laughs> you can see what conversations we've had, and hopefully it will inspire you to step out when the next live stream notification comes to you. If you've subscribed, you'll you'll get notifications of a live stream like this. And then you can jump in and you can join the live chat, which would be totally cool. And uh, and it just gives you an idea of the, the the community and the culture of being part of the Cow Country family. So make new friends, connect with people that share our love and passion for vintage. And thanks so much for carving out some time out of your busy Saturday to become a part of this and to celebrate this machine that came in broken and troubled. And again, Circle back because I'm going to add the links for all of the pictures showing the workshop magic in motion, taking this machine from a troubled, disabled, crippled, stumbling, bumbling machine to the brilliant, strong Japanese clone that you saw today. 
So Japanese clones, they have the ability to really amaze you, don't they? I hope you've been amazed by Penny Young's and Penny's actually going to be coming up shortly to pick up this machine. So I better stop blah, blah, blah. And even though Michelle said she likes it when I blah, blah, blah. Your sound didn't go what I was pretending like. Like a silent movie type thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. And God bless. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Oh, yeah. And Umi and her friend are here, too. Nice. Look at how tall Umi is. She's like a giant. Like an absolute giant. Good gravy. I think she's a headbanger. Thanks, uh, banana. What is it? Wait a second. Hold on. It looks like Banana Diva. Banana Diva, what a fun name that is. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great to have you here. Great to have you here. All right, I'm getting ready to end the live stream, but the chat will stay active for a bit. If you need to connect with anybody or finish anything up, you'll have a limited amount of time. Take care, everybody. God bless and happy Memorial Day. Even when you did love, you still go.